welcome back to the Confidence After Cancer podcast. And I'm really excited this week because I've got Nikki Woods who's going to be joining me. Nikki is an expert in many areas, but today we're really going to be talking about menopause. And for me, my early menopause was brought on when I was going through chemotherapy. And at the time I was diagnosed with cancer and I was plunged straight into the world of chemotherapy. And it was an almost, you know, by the way, is what the breast cancer nurse said to me, just to let you know, this is going to plunge you into um, early menopause. I didn't really know what that meant. And at the time I had other things on my mind. I'd just been diagnosed with an aggressive cancer. So I was like, yeah, okay, whatever. So my, my treatment was 15 years ago and I don't know if things have changed now, but I got absolutely no medical help with my menopause. And one of the things, I started reading things and trying to do a little bit of research and I was really scared about HRT. I'd heard about this thing, but I was also told by maybe different people it could cause breast cancer. It wasn't a good thing to have if you've had breast cancer. So I really shied away from it. And now I'm wondering if I was ill-informed and I really want to know more about it. And the other thing was I dismissed my symptoms and I presume, Nikki, when we get into this, we're going to talk about the fact that different people have different symptoms. But I sort of dismissed my symptoms as trivial as, as I was fighting to survive. I was I'm fighting cancer at the time. But now I've, I've got a little bit of space and I'm on a mission to thrive, not just survive. And I know Nikki shares my belief that we can all live a long and healthy life if we do the right things. So really excited to speak to Nikki today. Nikki is an amazing guest. After many years working at a high level in the corporate world, a bit like myself, she now helps women feel as confident and as successful in their bodies as they do in their careers, able to feel themselves again by improving their shape, their fitness, their health, mindset, and confidence through personal training, coaching, and tailored nutrition strategies. So welcome, Nikki. It's good to see you. Thank you so much for coming onto my podcast. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's good to see you. Magic of technology. I love it. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to start off, Nikki, as I said, you, you work in a lot of different areas on holistic approach to health, but really want to talk to you today about menopause. And I personally would like to know more about the menopause what is the definition of menopause? And and also, I've heard recently the, the expression perimenopausal, and I'm not really sure what that means. So can you explain what that is, please? Absolutely. And this is one of the things that in the last maybe 12 months, two years, has really become um, more into the fore, this word perimenopause. Um, and Strictly speaking, menopause is the day after you haven't had a period for 12 months. So the average age of non-surgical menopause, i.e. it hasn't been brought on by a hysterectomy or by chemo, is 51 in this country. It can differ by ethnic grouping and also certain medical conditions. And obviously some women do experience it a lot earlier. Perimenopause is the period of time that in the past is what we've called menopause which peri means like kind of in the period of, in the transition of. Typically, that's about, could be five years, could be 10 years. That's where our hormones are fluctuating. That's when we're getting all those symptoms that we associate with what we used to call being menopausal. So your body's in transition. Sometimes your hormones are going to be up and down, bouncing around, but generally they are declining. This is what's causing the symptoms, and this is what causes us all the problems. With yourself, for example, that period of time was much shorter because it mm -hmm. happened for a medical reason. Right. So for someone who hasn't got any medical reasons, the, t the period of perimenopause is a lot longer than someone like yourself who has it because of a medical treatment. That's really interesting. Thank you for that. And can you talk to, again, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it's different for different people, but what are the common symptoms? Um, and you just said about, you know, it's, it is different if it's brought on by cancer treatment than by a natural menopause. And it, it's interesting that using that expression, the natural menopause, because it's almost like, I don't know, things have changed so much now and people are talking more about menopause. It's become more of a common thing to talk about. I think probably when my mother and my grandmother went through it, nobody talked. I think you just got on with it in those days, didn't you? I think that was the expression. But um, yeah, if we can talk about the symptoms. So how will people know, you know, what are the symptoms to look out for? So one of the really 
important things to understand is there's some symptoms that are really obvious and there's a lot that are more subtle and there's a lot that you only realize in retrospect because so much else is going on in life that there's a lot of symptoms that could be other things and it's only over time that you you suddenly Mm -hmm. go you know what I thought that was stress but it never went away Um, and also these other things have happened there's there's going on for 50 symptoms which is a lot (laughs) wow you can kind of group them but even just me saying that will give you the major message that it's not just hot sweats no um Mm -hmm. you know night sweats hot flushes etc yeah obviously one can be irregular periods more or less frequent periods or we've got heavier periods which is flooding which is Mm -hmm. as it sounds basically Um, we have the hot flushes the night sweats but there's also cold flushes for some people. Oh, yeah. I have that. Oh, I didn't know that. Hot flush and night sweat. I have had cold flushes. Um, wow. things, people with Raynaud's can feel like that, that gets worse, for example. Fatigue, um, both systemic fatigue, muscular fatigue, memory lapses, inability to focus, the famous brain, brain fog where mm. we can't quite think of what we were going to say. Um, we just feel like our brain isn't functioning on a level it used to be. For some women, clumsiness even, um, and just like because your equilibrium's kind of changed with all your hormones, um, right. it, it can feel like you're just a bit less in balance in terms of what you're doing and how you're relating to your body. And actually also, um, if some women will experience tinnitus, either worsening tinnitus or new tinnitus or other inner ear imbalance issues. So someone who's experiencing something like vertigo, many ears disease might feel like that's got worse as well. So you can see why all these things are starting to add up to how do you know whether, mm-hmm. whether it was or not. Yeah. Um, we can have quite a lot of significant um, vaginal and urinary symptoms. So vaginal or vulval dryness, um unpleasant sensations so for me for myself one of them was like this weird kind of electric shock stabbing pain sensation that used to wake me up in the morning which was delightful um a loss of or change in libido for some women either associated with what's going on down there or for other reasons um urinary tract infections or what's diagnosed as interstitial cystitis which is where you feel like you've got a urinary tract infection but right. they, if they ever do a bacterial culture, there's nothing there. Some women can find pelvic floor issues, a urinary incontinence, etc. Also, the GI system can be affected in terms of bloating. Um, but then there's all these other kind of random symptoms that also can be permanent. So mm-hmm. I'll run through a few. Thinning hair. Um, I never knew this until I started having much more hair loss. My hairdresser, who was a man, was like, yeah, you're at that age. It happens. Never knew. Mm. Um, some women can have brittle, brittle and nails, for example. Um, there can be some mood, quite significant mood issues that come up. A lot of women feel like they're just an angrier person. Mm, yeah. Also, a lot of women can feel a lot more anxious. Um, depression, insomnia. Um, all of these can be quite, you, you kind of feel like you're changing who you are. Who you are. Um, but then there can be quite significant joint pain issues, uh, stiffness, muscle weakness, strange sensations, like I mentioned, kind of electric shock earlier, also tingling mm-hmm. sensations. Um, some women can find that if they have never had migraine before, that their migraines suddenly start. Women who have migraine can feel like they're a lot worse. So um, red, restless legs, that's another re- really random one. Um, I think I mentioned insomnia already um, and Mm -hmm. also um, this weird 4am waking that everyone seems to have as well. (laughs) And of course, on top of all that, everyone seems to feel like they're either gaining weight or that their fat distribution is changing to be more like a a spare time. So you can see that that's a massive breadth of symptoms and they could be caused by so many other things as well. So it's also yeah. about kind of adding up all of that. Uh, one thing to say is that really there's not a blood test. So if someone goes to their doctor and they say, can you tell if I'm in perimenopause? 
the doctor may run some blood tests like thyroid, certain vitamin levels, iron, et cetera, to discount other things. But if a woman is over 45, she should be diagnosed as being in perimenopause on symptoms alone. Between 40 and 45, the NICE guidelines say they may be useful to do some blood tests. Under 40, they would do blood tests, but they would be timed. Now, obviously, if you've been put into a surgical mm-hmm. menopause, that isn't relevant. However, what can mm-hmm. be additionally confusing on surgical menopause that is from chemotherapy rather than surgical menopause that's from having things actually removed is that for some women, depending on their age, it can put you into menopause, but then you can come out again. Whereas other women oh. can, yeah, I know. I, I assumed once it's done, it's done. Yeah, yeah, it's a minefield, I, isn't it? It's so complicated. I, yeah. I was researching this and it said that for some women, the chemo can put them into menopause and they never come back out. Other women, they can have several years where they technically are post menopausal and then they can go back to being pre menopausal again. Oh, wow. Wow, I didn't know that. No, I didn't. Blimey. (laughs) It's a very, very complex subject, isn't it? Blimey, we could talk all day about this. I'm thinking as well, a lot of the the symptoms you just talked about, you know, like the the fatigue and the brain fog, and there's a lot of that that goes with with cancer treatment as well. You know, people call it um, chemo fog. And so there's a lot of crossover. And how would you know? You probably would never know. Is it the fatigue? Is it just your age? Is it the menopause? Is it the chemo? What's going on? It's such a mixture, isn't it, of different things going on. But I'm wondering, are the symptoms to do with um, mental health? You know, because I think, like you said, about anxiety and about feeling, you know, you come into that time in your life and it can... For a lot of women I know, it coincides with things going on in their personal life. Maybe their children are growing up or maybe they're realising, sadly, they're never going to have children if that's something that they really wanted. So is it a physical thing or is it a mental health thing or is it a, is it a mixture of both? It's, it's both. So some yeah. of the symptoms are very physical mm-hmm. and they could affect you mentally if they are calling, causing you fatigue or significant pain. Because obviously if you're living in a lot of pain or you're not sleeping or you're very fatigued, you can feel more ratty anyway. Of course. But some of them are purely physical, like joint stiffness, for example. Right. But then others can be significantly mental. And also things like anxiety, depression, um, you know, mood changes. Again, if you're going through something as huge as having a cancer treatment, then how do you know what's what? for that reason as well because that that's a big mm-hmm. thing to be psychologically dealing with anyway um there are some symptoms that are very much either I, I don't know whether to say mental or neurological so for myself for example mm-hmm. i had significant kind of i wouldn't even call it brain fog um i literally i was struggling to drive at one point because um I just didn't have the cognitive ability to drive my car and think about where it was going. So the task of, you know, changing gear, indicating, watching what else was on the road, plus the task of driving, even though it was a journey that I knew so well because I've done multiple times a day for, you know, going on 20 years, those two things combined were too much for my brain. Or for example, um, I'm the queen of setting pans on fire because I'll put something on and I'll go out. (laughs) There was a period of time where I locked myself out of my house repeatedly. um, And I was setting fire to pans repeatedly because my brain just wasn't capturing that as something that that needed to stay in as important. Yeah. How scary. How scary, like you, like you say, you've, you've worked at a high level in corporate life. You've you've lived a, a life of, where you've had a lot of demands, where you knew, you thought, well, I was the same. I thought I knew who I was and what I was about. And I was the queen of multitasking. I used to pride myself on that. Oh, yeah, I can do that. Oh, t- give me another task to do and I'll do it. And then all of a sudden I was like, I cannot do more than one thing at a time. And that's it's terrifying because you sort of lose your sense of identity. You're like, who am I? When did I turn into this? quivering wreck when did I turn into this mush of a brain what's happened to me how scary 
And this is the thing that we have some women who get very worried they've got dementia, especially if they've got mm-hmm. a history of that in their family. Yeah, so it can yeah. be very frightening and they may not want to talk to anyone about it. But then there's other women who they're, they're just very frightened for their job security. So, for example, if they've got, a, um, you know, I think it was even Davina McCall was saying she was interviewing someone and she literally it was someone she knew so well and she could not remember their name. And it's just gone. But like, so imagine if you're a solicitor, yeah. for example, and your brain is not functioning on things like yeah. case law, terminology, et cetera, how frightening that is that you're going to make a mistake or that someone's going to think you're not competent in your job anymore. And these are real concerns that mm-hmm. people have, and they may be scared to share them as well. And then on top of all that, we've got this other layer which can be uh, not for everyone but like can be the adding up of all these symptoms together can bring this other layer of I've heard it described as an absence of joy and how how do you get around that it's very difficult especially when you're very tired and you maybe have to advocate for yourself Mm -hmm. or something um in in some ways at least if someone is experiencing something as significant a life change as cancer treatment then maybe the support there for them but if this is just as part of general life then you can see how people can just end up feeling lower and lower and lower and not really knowing what's going on with no obvious support and and this is why sometimes quite often women will go to the gps and say "I'm, i'm really feeling not okay and the GP yeah. is like, have some antidepressants. That was going to be my next question, really. What help is available? I think we've all got a bit used to Dr. Google, but that's a bit of a minefield, isn't it? And so if you want some proper help and advice, what would you recommend, Nikki? You know, would you go to your GP? Because I would imagine some GPs are more switched on than others to this sort of thing. Like I say, you don't just want antidepressants. You want somebody who's going to understand what you're going through. And actually antidepressants aren't the recommended first line treatment for um women who haven't got a previous history of depression um it is hrt now obviously there is some complications like you mentioned earlier around um dependent on the the medical risk for the woman so if someone's had breast cancer treatment that's a more compli- complicated, complex discussion than someone who hasn't sure. got any risk of that in their family. There are still indications that systemic HRT, which is estrogen and progesterone, um, for most women who have had breast cancer or have a very high risk of breast cancer, is, is contraindicated. However, mm-hmm. if you were suicidal, then it's a balance of risk, isn't it? That maybe yeah, HRT course, would yeah. be the lesser of the two risks. Um, so that's yeah, a discussion sure. that is quite nuanced and it needs to go to each individual person. However, even within that, sure. you'll find different menopause specialists would have a different risk appetite for whether they would or wouldn't prescribe it for someone with, with that family history, for example. And obviously within breast cancer, the, the, there's different types of breast cancer um, and some are more hormone modulated than others. So those are sure. higher risk. For um, women who cannot or do not want to take HRT, it doesn't mean there's no treatment whatsoever. So when I'm talking about HRT generally, I'm talking about systemic estrogen and progesterone. So that's estrogen in the form of a gel or a patch commonly and progesterone commonly as eutrogestin, which is a soft gel. However, I mentioned earlier, these quite can be quite significant vaginal, vulval, urinary symptoms. Now, you can get a pessary, a cream, or a ring of estrogen that's topical estrogen, and that's entirely Mm -hmm. safe for women, even if they cannot take any other form of HRT because of breast cancer risk. And that can be game-changing. Yeah. So So would you get that from your doctor? Would your doctor prescribe that? So... Yeah. Mm -hmm. You'd go to your GP in the first instance for any of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The GP, if they are following the NICE guidelines, Mm -hmm. should 
when I mentioned the thing about the blood tests earlier and if you're over 45 diagnosed on symptoms, obviously, if you've had a surgical menopause from some treatment, then again, they should be diagnosing on the symptoms regardless of the age. The, the topical okay. estrogen, the estrogen cream, for example, the local estrogen, that's completely safe for everybody. And that's just a normal prescription given by your doctor. Doctors right. can initiate prescribing of the systemic estrogen and progesterone, HRT. There's a third hormone that we haven't yet mentioned, testosterone. Now, that mm -hmm. was the one that meant I no longer set things on fire, lock myself out the house and can drive again uh -huh. and right. have the cognitive ability to talk to you today. <laughs> now, <Yeah. laughs> most GPs cannot or will not prescribe testosterone oh. for one reason is that they don't believe that we need it and secondly because they're scared and thirdly a lot of ccgs won't let them so testosterone has to be prescribed in in the first instance in most areas not all by a menopause specialist clinic or a private menopause consultant after three months and follow-up bloods, this is one where we do want to do bloods at the start and we do want to do bloods after three mm -hmm. months to see what levels are. They can then refer back to the GP and ask the GP to take over prescribing and the GP is obligated to do that. So uh -huh. if someone goes to their GP and they are started on estrogen and progesterone and some of these symptoms aren't going away, this is when a conversation about testosterone might for um, strictly speaking, it's only meant to be prescribed for libido. However, there's an awful lot of um, anecdotal evidence from practitioners now and from people like me that it isn't about libido. It's about cognition, strength, mobility, etc. Yeah. So if you're someone who's already on the other forms of HRT and you're finding those things are still an issue, ask your doctor to refer you to a menopause clinic. There's a bloody long wait. Sorry about that. Or spend a couple hundred quid mm -hmm. if you can afford it, go private and then get referred back to him. If you're someone who goes to your GP and immediately sure. they dismiss anything to do with any form of HRT whatsoever, again, you need to ask to be referred to a either as menopause specialist, if there's one who's got a particular interest within your GP practice, or you need to ask to refer to the menopause clinic, or if you've got the money, I would say just go private. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Nick. That's really interesting, really useful. A lot of stuff there that I just wasn't appreciating. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I just wanted to mention, Nikki, you, you, you know, one of the things I like about you is you share my belief that we shouldn't just be masking symptoms, um, but getting to the root cause of anything that's going on for us and dealing with that. And so it's not just about taking HRT, isn't it? I, I'm thinking about what lifestyle changes can we make to become stronger, happier and healthier, which is what we all want. Absolutely. And this is the thing. There's a lot of evidence that what we eat and what we do can help with symptoms. In some cases, it might make symptoms go away. So although I've talked a lot about HRT there, lifestyle is a huge part of the puzzle. And if you're just expecting to take this magic HRT and all of a sudden your diet of caffeine and hamburgers suddenly isn't impactful well that's just never going to happen so for example um there's quite a lot of evidence that the higher the level of processed food in someone's diet the worse their perimenopausal symptoms are however we also know that eating just a load of processed food isn't good for all sorts of other things as well for example um mm -hmm. there's also yeah. evidence yeah. that um we already know there's evidence around things like stress and depression, around walking, daylight, decent sleep, stress management, and all of that applies in perimenopause as well. There is some evidence that um, doing exercise, which makes you sweat, whether that's cardio or resistance training, can lead to lessened, lessened um, hot flashes and night sweats. So, um, again, what a great reason to do exercise and strength mm -hmm. training. Yeah. 
Um, obviously, certain issues such as libido may also be related to some relationship work that, that we need to do. It's not necessarily about one yeah. thing. And so I would say for anyone who's thinking of any of these stuff, yeah, sure, go speak to your GP and see what your GP says. But your GP, if it's a good GP, will probably be talking about whether you move, whether you sleep, what you're eating, how how you're hydrated. Um, cognition can be massively impacted by being dehydrated. So if you don't drink enough water, you're going to get brain fog anyway. You're going to have lower energy. You're going to have higher fatigue. All of these things, of course, speak to your GP. But if they're a good GP, they're going to talk about all these other things as well. And the brilliant thing about most of these lifestyle interventions is it also has other positive impact. So it's lessening your chance of obesity, diabetes, particular lifestyle cancers, heart disease. It's going to make you stronger in old age, which means you're going to have a more active and full old age, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So all of the things that you keep hearing time and time again about eating real food, walking, moving, sleeping, these all apply to help us in perimenopause, but they have all these other extra bonuses as well. Plus, most of them mean that you've got a better looking body as well, which, of course, when we're women in midlife is, is a lot of, of people's concerns. Of course it is, yeah, and and I love that you, the fact a lot of the things that you just talked about. It's it's very you know most of them are free, most of them are very easy for you to do, and it's very empowering as well to think. Well, I don't have to wait for my doctor's appointment. There's things that I can do now, things I can do today. I can make sure I have a healthy meal. I can do some exercise. I can drink my water. There's a lot we can do for ourselves, isn't it? And it's about nurturing ourselves. And I think maybe a lot of women, speaking generally, but a lot of women in midlife. For all their lives, I put other people first. And maybe now this is the time to take that little step back and think, actually, this is time for me now. I need to give myself some attention. It's not just about going and getting a prescription. There's a lot going on here that I can do for myself. And, you know, I can't be there for everybody else. So I'm not looking after myself. So that, that's one of my big messages. It comes up time and time again with women who feel lost and uh, not sure what to do in their lives because they've never put themselves first. And so some great advice there, Nick. You really, really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Uh, it's great to speak to you. So I'd just like to say anybody who's listening to the podcast, if you'd like to connect with Nikki, her website and all her social details will be on the show notes below. I know if you're struggling with perimenopause or anything else we've talked about today, there are several ways that Nikki can help you. She's got lots of free information on her website that you can download. You could also book a consultation with her if that's what you want to do. She has online mini courses and a 12-week transformation program, which covers all aspects, some of what we've talked about, nutrition, fitness, mindset, habits, and perimenopause. And you can find out in the links below that I'm going to post. Thank you so much, Nikki. It was so interesting talking to you. I could have talked to you all day. Such a huge topic, and who knew? But I, I think the good thing is maybe people are talking more and more about this now. It's not something we have to shy away from, not something we have to be a little embarrassed about talking. And thank goodness there's people like you that are getting that message out there that there is help available. You don't have to suffer in silence. And it's so good to speak to you. Thank you, Nikki. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me.